I'm Marty Stauffer. Little more than a century ago, our Midwest was almost entirely a sea of grass. Hundreds and hundreds of miles of beautiful open prairie. Rich soil produced rich grassland, and the grass supported teeming herds of wildlife. Here our country's pioneers came. Some hurried further west to escape the monotony of the plains, but many stayed to cultivate them. Within a few decades, one of the largest and richest natural ecosystems on Earth was crisscrossed by roads and fences, plowed into the productive fields of today's corn and wheat belt. Our national park system was established to preserve examples of America's original landscape, along with its native plants and animals. Yet there is no national park to represent the vast plains that gave greatness to a young nation. What would it mean and what would it take to create a prairie park? More than any other animal, the American bison symbolizes the power and magnificence of the plain. It's estimated that as many as 60 million of these shaggy beasts once roamed the open prairie, the greatest spectacle of herd animals ever seen. Yet the bison was only one of many splendid large mammals native to the plains. Wolves and bears stalked antelope and bighorn through the tall grass. Elk and bison grazed as far east as Pennsylvania. The bison was an indispensable source of food, clothing, shelter, and fuel to the Plains Indians. But Indians and bison were obstacles to the settlement of the prairies. In a few short, bloody years, both were pushed aside to make room for the white man's progress. Grassland fit for bison was also fit for cattle. And soil that supported an impressive array of lush wild grasses was great for growing crops. Families hurried west in caravans to break the soil and to stake their claim. By the turn of the century, much of the prairie was fenced and planted. Increasingly complex machinery made it possible to replace more and more native grassland with waving fields of grain. Where bison once roamed like cloud shadows, great combines now march in straight rows. Grass is basic to both prairie and plains, but different grasses, growing to different heights, create different types of grassland. The tall grass prairie is a sea of saddle-high blue stem, switchgrass, and cordgrass. Farther west, these same grasses grow shorter, and along with others like buffalo grass, create the mixed grass prairie. Still farther west, blue grama and buffalo grass dominate the drier, short grass prairie. The mixed and short grass prairies together are what we call the Great Plains. Fed by up to 40 inches of rain a year, tall grass prairie once covered a quarter billion acres. Mixed grass prairie gets higher winds and less precipitation, 14 to 23 inches. Short grass prairie, in the dry, rain shadow of the Rockies, averages only 10 inches a year. Each type of prairie is graced by its own special galaxy of wildflowers. 
15 to 20 varieties of them burst into bloom each week between March and October. Grasses may seem dull by comparison, but their leaves and stems are arranged for maximum photosynthetic efficiency. Grasses are also flowering plants, the third largest family of flowering plants in the world. Grass flowers are small and inconspicuous, but close up, they're as pretty as any other kind. Both flowers and seeds provide food. In fact, unlike trees or shrubs, the whole plant is edible and its way of growing in dense stands provides shelter as well as food for many animals. Many grasses also have an extensive network of fibrous roots that grow sideways as well as down. These roots and runners hold the soil together and enable animals to burrow beneath it. Complex root systems present several advantages to the grass plant and to animals which depend on grass for food. In times of drought, the deepest roots remain in contact with soil moisture so the plant can survive. The energy stored in grass roots also helps to regenerate the above ground part of the plant after it has been grazed or destroyed by fire. Another advantage of grasses is that new growth takes place at the base rather than the tip of the leaf. If one cottontail nibbles away the tip, the leaf will continue growing to provide food for another. But the single most important factor in prairie ecology is rainfall. The short grass prairie with the antelope lay is green only during spring rains. During the hot summer months, these high plains lie brown and dormant. Fortunately, grass retains its nutritious qualities even when dry. With no trees in sight, the great horned owl builds its nest and raises its young on the ground, sheltered by sagebrush. Wind, as well as rainfall, also controls life on the plains. The pronghorn is not a true antelope, but it evolved on our western plains and is one of the most successful of all prairie creatures. One of the fastest animals on earth, its speed and keen eyesight are ideal adaptations for avoiding prairie predators. Badger is another highly successful prairie dweller, common to all three types of grassland. This large, feisty member of the weasel family is one of many burrowing creatures at home on the prairie and underneath it. Burrows provide shelter in a treeless land and insulate their inhabitants from extremes of heat and cold. The badger aggressively hunts prairie dogs, pocket gophers, mice, and even rattlesnakes by digging into their burrows after them. If the occupant is away, the badger will dig in and wait for it to return. Badgers are solitary creatures, except during the mating season, when they briefly form pairs. Like all burrowing animals, the badger is important to prairie ecology. Tunneling in general turns over the soil and keeps it aerated. And the badger in particular 
helped control rodent and reptile populations. It can dig with incredible speed, disappearing completely in a matter of seconds. This western box turtle, on the other hand, is anything but speedy. The badger will eat whatever it can get its long, sharp claws on or into. But the turtle has shut itself in, as invulnerable as a rock. The harder the badger cries with its claws, the tighter the turtle clams up. Perhaps this perplexed predator thinks that the turtle has somehow left its shell and is digging this burrow to wait in until the turtle returns. The loamy prairie soil gets a good loosening up as the badger performs its baffled dance of defeat. Once again, patience decides the outcome. In a similar way, the effort to establish a national prairie park has required great patience, and the course has often been stormy. I love it out here. These wide open spaces where you can see almost forever. Let's look a little closer. Grass. This is buffalo grass. Like most grasses, it has an elaborate root system. The settlers chopped chunks of this out of the earth and stacked it up to build their sod houses. And this one is wheat grass, named for its seeds. It's an important food. And this is switchgrass. There are dozens of different species of grasses out here on the prairie, but this one is the most important of all. This is big blue stem. It was the dominant grass of the tall grass prairies. There's food and shelter all in one plant. It's no wonder that this prairie habitat is the very richest we have in sheer numbers of different species of wildlife. Thousands of square miles of our nation once looked like this. Now there's only a few scattered areas which still do. I think we should preserve what little we have left. 
After all, we have the greatest national park system in the world. We preserve canyon land, mountain land, forest land, and seashore for the benefit of wildlife and the enjoyment of millions of humans. Why should we leave out our great heritage of grassland? Much as I love this big sky country and would like to save it intact, I must admit that this whole concept of a prairie park was not my idea. I wish it were, because I think it's great. But many people have been working for years to create a tall grass prairie park in Kansas or Oklahoma. And one man, noted naturalist Dr. Durwood Allen, has almost single-handedly spearheaded a plan to preserve a million acres of our western Great Plains. A million acres sounds like a lot of land. Where could we find a place to put a park that big? Tall, mixed, and short grass prairie once combined to form one vast original prairie. As America grew, the prairie shrank until now only two main areas remain. A Great Plains National Park could be located somewhere in this area. A million acres would take up hardly more space than the dot of this question mark. And a tall grass prairie national park, though much smaller, could find a home somewhere within this area. The ideal way to manage either park would be to leave it in as natural a state as possible. Fire, for instance, has always been a major factor in prairie ecology. Nowadays, controlled fires are set by man to keep grasslands healthy and to prevent the invasion of trees. In times past, prairie wildfires were started by lightning and fanned by wind. They spread fast, burning old dry grass and making way for lush new growth. The effect of man-made fires is much the same today as it was in past centuries, when settlers told of watching immense pillars of fire seething across the plains. Although grasses are much more resistant to fire than animals, surprisingly few creatures are killed by grass fires. Some can fly, some can burrow, and some can run. In the wake of the flames, the prairie looks devastated, but what looks like death is only the prelude to new life. Most of today's prairie is crisscrossed by utility lines, railways, fences, and roads. Some creatures have learned to adapt to these conditions. The deer mouse requires only a small amount of territory, and the kestrel can fly across any boundary. But not all wildlife is so adaptable. Most native prairie animals need to roam wide open spaces on the ground in order to be as free as a bird in the sky. Such spaces are few and far between. Great Plains and a tall grass prairie national park would mean preserving a few natural, self-contained areas of grassland. Creatures large and small, vegetarian and carnivore alike, could exist freely, instead of being hemmed in by fences and highways. These mule deer, as well as their cousins, the whitetails, were once common to prairie and plains. With the help of man, 
that could be rejoined by other original inhabitants. A prairie park would provide sufficient space for herds of bison and elk, as well as deer, to live in natural harmony with the seasons. Perhaps most important, in a prairie park, the eternal ritual between predator and prey could continue as it has for countless ages. The bobcat seems to treat the prairie chicken more as a toy than as a potential meal. It looks as if the bird is totally at the mercy of the bobcat, but it finally tires of this treatment and flies in the face of its attacker. A million acres of empty grassland. Who needs it, some might say. It wouldn't be empty. Thousands of kinds of plants and animals would fill it, interacting as they always had. We could preserve not only a slice of history, but a chance for ages and ages of evolution to continue at nature's pace. Such a national park would be a tribute not only to nature, but to man. A unique opportunity to recreate a past we nearly destroyed. Wise men have always had a vision of harmony with nature. Shouldn't it be a wise nation's tribute to itself to establish a prairie park? I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.